Hey everybody, welcome to the Watch and Listen podcast. This is a podcast all about watches. I'm your host, Matt Farr, and I do this little show here with my friend Cameron Weiss, the CEO of the Weiss Watch Company and a master watchmaker. Not a lot of those in America. Not a lot, my friends. This episode is brought to you by Crown & Caliber, the number one place to buy a secondhand luxury watch online. Like a car, you can save a ton of money on a watch by buying it secondhand, especially if it's anything besides a Rolex. Trust me. If it's not a Rolex, don't buy it new. <laughs> buy it used at Crown & Caliber. If you've got a watch laying around your place, maybe you're not into it anymore, maybe you've grown out of it, you want to trade up, trade down, or trade sideways, Talk to Crown and Caliber. They can trade you into something excellent uh, from their inventory. Make a good, fair deal. No shady parking lot stuff. No haggling. Just send pictures. They send an offer for trade or buy. Super, super easy. I've now bought like mm, four watches from Crown and Caliber, and it's good. They've got a whole team of watchmakers. So if uh, they, you know they service all the stuff and make it good to go before it goes out, and if something happens, they will fix it. They're like that. They're good folks. Um, use code CAM150, C-A-M-150, to get $150 off your first watch purchase, crown and caliber, from your boys at Watch and Listen. Uh, we're also brought to you by Beeline Coffee. Let me just pull out my mug here and... Ah, it's 6, 10 p.m. and I'm drinking Beeline coffee. That's what's up. That's how tasty this stuff is. It's yummy. The uh, smoking, uh, the roasted tire is my roast. It's delicious and it's in their store now. Use code CHRONO, C-H-R-O-N-O. Get 15% off anything in the Beeline coffee store. It's really, really good coffee, guys. Um, this episode is going to be fun. We're talking about a fun company, a young company. We are talking about Swatch, the history of Swatch. And like, uh, unlike uh, all the other companies we talk about on this show that trace their roots back to like some dude, you know, in Switzerland in the 1800s, uh, Swatch starts in 1978. So we have fax machines pretty much uh, when they started Swatch. So uh, it's all happened in very recent history and and uh, fun colors, funky stuff, and I think the most expensive watch on this entire show is like $100. So, uh, <laughs> oh no, there's some super rare collect one that's like 600 That's the most expensive. So, it's affordability day on Watch and Listen. It's a good show. Let's get to it. Maybe it's afternoon, maybe it's evening. Who knows? But it's the Watch and Listen podcast. Here we's at. What up, Cameron? How's it going? How'd you doing, man? Good. We got a big pile of watches today, man. Yeah, it's uh, the Swatch and Listen podcast today. Swatch and Listen. <laughs> oh, I think you just titled the episode for us yeah. today. This may be the first one where we attempt to put the title of our episode of our show in the episode. We we don't we don't do that. We, we're modest. We don't we don't put blah Watch and Listen podcast. It's just the episode. <laughs> um. We are motoring through the uh, the, uh, the the deep dives in the brands. I kind of like it, though. I like learning about the history of the brands. Yeah, and a lot of times the the history is so different from the modern day brand the way yeah. the way it's kind of advertised today and marketed. Right. So it's cool to see where they came from and how they ended up with their current lineup of watches and. Totally, and I think uh, you know, having spent the last week, um, I was traveling and I was in Europe. I was in England, and I really. Um, had I like I stopped and looked at some Oris watches and some just IWC stuff and just having more of a breadth of knowledge of the the models and th where they come from I think was really it's like you know it's like studying art in school and then going to a museum same kind of thing yeah appreciate it no appreciation swatch swatch is like I don't know I didn't know what to really think about swatch I mean it was so it's so ubiquitous it's so iconic uh, but it's kind of known for being cheap, so it's easy to sort of overlook as being any sort of uh, real significance in watchmaking. And then you think of the Swatch Group, which owns business companies that sell hundreds of thousands of dollars of watches. You go, wait a minute, what the hell's going on here? Yeah. Um, it's, it's just, 
not something that like real watch nerds think about until they really think about it. I just, I'll, having read the history of Swatch over the last couple of days, what I found so interesting about it is, unlike these other companies that go back to like the 1800s, you know, and I got a, I, I find one guy's name, you know, that started the whole thing. You know, there's no Mr. Swatch. Um, Swatch is, a, is an entirely modern conception um, done, conceived by corporations uh, by people that are still alive and working today uh, and that have that did something in response to the courts crisis that opened up uh, uh, such a huge market that it overtook the luxury company. Yeah. Um, yeah, it went, it went beyond luxury. And actually, these cheap plastic watches were what kept the fancy watches alive. Yeah. They kept watchmakers employed and kept all of that history in Switzerland still going so that we could enjoy really fancy watches and expensive watches today. Yeah, the parallel, I think, is like if you're into cars, and I imagine at least a good portion of the people who listen to this podcast are probably into cars. That's probably how they found us. But uh, the equivalent would be um, there's a guy named Gordon Murray who designed a car called the McLaren F1, which for like a decade was the fastest car in the in the world. And it was the fastest car in the world by accident. It was never uh, his goal to build the fastest car in the world. He just happens to have done that. And once he did that, he turned his attention to working with um, a, a, a building a city car, an efficient car, it's a cheap, efficient car. And so when you take people who... Uh, have a, a, a focus on superb engineering that creates, in, in Mr. Murray's case, the fastest car in the world, and they turn that focus to mass production, efficiency, um, economy. Uh, I think that's what we have with Swatch. The, the people working on and designing Swatches are the same people who were designing movements and cases for five, six-figure watches. Maybe yeah. not five, six, four, five figure watches. Let's say. Yeah, a lot of crossover um, between uh, the really expensive stuff and and the, the yeah. new quartz watches. And from. a really interesting story. And uh, and even though it's only uh, it, it's only a couple years older than I am, there are a lot of uh, really fun details. And in fact, there are so many details that we are only going to be able to scratch the surface here. But thanks to uh, two collectors, personal collectors, and Mr. Ryan Fitzgerald and. Uh, uh, Jeff Rush, uh, they've sent us uh, a collection of like 20 watches uh, that, that really spans the uh, the Swatch history. So we got a bunch of stuff to look at today, too. Yeah. Which is awesome. <laughs> so before we get into the story, you're going to want to follow me on Instagram, The Smoking Tire, of course, and Weiss Watch Company on Instagram. You can also follow Cameron M. Weiss on Instagram, but it's really more about that business. <laughs> How's your new uh, taking orders? New watch going out? Is this are these cases for the new watches? Uh, those are actually main plates, but we've got uh, oh, cases for are. the new watches that I am hand polishing right now. These are cases. So, yeah, those are, and actually, that's me that. hand polishing the cases <laughs> right there <laughs> on a Sunday. Yes, on a Cameron Sunday. Cameron Weiss on a Sunday yep. in a hot workshop hand polishing cases. Yeah, those old ass machines you bought are taking up a lot of space in the back. Are they doing anything now, or are they just sculpture? Right now, they're just sculpture. <laughs> they're art inspiration yeah. looking at them uh <laughs> makes me feel like uh like i'm part of a historical trade like yeah. watchmaking so it's nice to nice to see them but they're not making parts yet Alrighty then <laughs> well uh swatch has a really good uh a pretty good website but it's not great with imagery so you can you can follow along on the website if you want but uh we've we're gonna have a little more visual for you uh here if you so choose so here we go 1978, it all begins. My fiance was one. <laughs> I was negative three. Yeah. The quartz crisis in Switzerland. Um, we've talked about it in pretty much every history uh, episode we've done. The watch industry is in the toilet. Quartz has pretty much eaten everyone alive. Yep. Um, and uh, so you have, man, can you, Oswag, can you tell me what Oswag, can you pronounce it right? Uh, so it's a, uh a S U A G is yeah. It's a um, well, it, it's a group of companies basically. Yeah. A group that is trying to consolidate all of the watch companies and and different uh, parts of watch companies. Like you have the case makers, the dial makers, the movement makers, all these different people who were go all going out of business. Right. 
Uh, there just wa- there was no demand for these fancy watches. Everyone wanted these new quartz and digital and all of this uh, fancy stuff that was supposed to be the wave of the future. Um, so, so this was the the goal was to bring all of these companies and all the knowledge together to then keep it around. Uh, and it, and it hang on, <laughs> hang on. So two major ones. You had S I H H and you had A S U A G. A is oh my god, I'm gonna butcher this. Ready? <laughs> Oleg Main Schweizerisch Urin Industry A G. Yes. A S U E. I'm just gonna go with Ashwag. <laughs> yeah. Which is how you speak out the uh, acronym. So uh, one of the companies Ashwag owned was Eta. Which we uh, we know they make movements, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, and they were a subsidiary, and they launch a uh, a new watch called the Delirium Tremens, and it is the thinnest watch in the world at two millimeters thin. It is it <laughs> it doesn't look. I mean, if you look at a picture of this thing, it doesn't actually look like it would work. I mean, I don't I don't know where anything would go. Yeah, where does anything go? It's uh, it's actually built in such a way where the case includes the bridges. Yeah. So that so it all happens yeah. from the outside. Yeah, exactly. It's really crazy. And if you're into beers, you've heard of Delirium Tremens <laughs> beer. Yeah. Pretty sure this was this first. Was this uh, well, I don't know. I don't know how long Delirium Tremens the beer has been around. Yeah. Has it been around longer than seventy eight? I don't know. I don't know. This came out in seventy nine. The Delirium Tremens watch. Um. And this, I mean, this is not a, this was like, it was like made of gold. This is a fine watch. Uh, and, and the point of it, like Cameron said, is to combine parts of the bridges and main plates into the case itself. And although this is a fine watch, that concept of combining parts of the movement and, and parts of the case into one piece is what led to the, uh, the ethos of Swatch uh, manufacturing. Uh, the success of this watch uh, leads uh, Ashuag to ask itself, um, is it possible to make a quality watch out of plastic? So they, the Aswag sort of had a, an internal kind of like research team, like advanced concepts or whatever. And so this Delirium Tremens watch was part of the advanced concepts uh, you know, division, which, but, but then it was like, next thing, can we do it out of plastic? And uh, that turned into... Um, the Delirium Vulgaire, which I actually can't find any photos of, and then subsequently into the Popularis, which was the first watch launched under the Swatch name in 1981. Um, do we have? We don't have one of those. No. I, it's actually, I couldn't find a picture of that because they use the word launched, but I don't think it was ever actually sold because, by all accounts, the first uh, Swatch watches were sold in 1982. And uh, they were just simply called the Gent, Swatch Gent. And uh, here, this image is one of what they call the originals. It was sort of a, a pre, uh, uh, pre, it was just the basic Swatch. Here it was. And uh, in 1982, their first Swatch, yeah, they made 300,000 of them the first year. That's like more watches than a lot of major companies had made in their entire history up until then. Yeah. It was like super, super, super mass production. We're even at that was, time. It was like it was like Rolex production, annual production but, for Rolex. Yeah, you, you're talking. Swatch did that immediately, just with the most incredible uh, manufacturing and assembly lines to make something that's brand new technology. Yeah. So it's pretty impressive to make that many. And uh, you may notice this is for sale on Etsy right now. This watch was uh, fifty francs. When it was new, and uh, it's now six hundred dollars. <laughs> this one's in kind of rough shape too. Um, so Nicholas Hayek, who we have discussed uh, many times, uh, Nicholas G. Hayek, give us the quick background on Nicholas G. Hayek, Cameron. So Nicholas G. Hayek at the time owned an engineering firm called Hayek Engineering, and he was contracted with the Swiss government uh, to come up with ideas and organize the watch industry so that it wouldn't uh, disappear because of the quartz crisis. We needed to, or not we, I was not involved, but uh, they needed to figure out how to save Swiss watchmaking. Right. So the, uh, he, he uh, after they make these three, first 300,000, 
oh, this is a good idea. He then authorizes a test in the U.S. market with a U.S. distributor and, uh, and promotes uh, integrating the plastic and uh, Swatch watches into the Ashwag uh, profile uh, portfolio moving forward. Later in the year, they then uh, launch globally from Switzerland, and that's 1982. Uh, in 1983, one year later, they make their millionth watch. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, and then, and yes, this, this, and they're still making these, the basic gent, uh, and they have, they were selling ladies ones for 30, uh, 30 francs, and then men's for 50, 1983, flat fee, 50 francs, all swatches, which is an interesting concept. Yeah. Flat pricing. That same year, 1983, uh, SSIH and Ashwag merge to create SMH, which is the Society Mechanical Electric <laughs> Mechanical Electric or something like that. <laughs> uh, yes, um, I don't know the exact one. I, I I usually just use the initials as SMH. well. SMH. Yeah, it is SMH. Uh, in 1984, one year later, they have a Guinness record by building a 162 meter tall swatch, and uh, they, and they also. And uh, they also have their three millionth watch sold. So they go in 82, 300,000, 83, a million, 84, 3 million. That is just crazy. And we're still like in peak quartz crisis right now, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, that that's the, the reason the sales are going up so much because everyone wants to get the new thing that is more accurate and it's seen as the future. Um, the future of watches and, and timekeeping and everything. So to have one that's also a crazy wacky design and something totally unique, uh -huh. potentially collectible, that was the, the hook right there. And yeah. Swiss as well. And Swiss. Uh, 1985, one year later, 10 million watches. I mean, the, the scale is just so crazy to go from not existing <laughs> yeah. to 10 million watches in five years. It's like that's that that's so successful. <laughs> Do we know how many uh how many Apple Watches were mm. sold in the first year? That'd mm. be an interesting one because I don't think that they they caught on uh as quick as swatches. How many Apple Watches were sold in the first year? Six Wow, six million. Six million during I mean, the fourth quarter. Just the fourth quarter? <laughs> Unbelievable. Of twenty sixteen. I guess more more population. Wow. Well, yeah, you can buy things on the internet. Yeah. Man. You could not, you couldn't buy things on the internet uh, before. 1985, their tenth, 10 millionth watch. And, and I'm sorry for the off centeredness of this picture. I can't figure out, odd. I can't figure out how to make this thing move to the <laughs> middle of the screen. But uh, this they call the limelight. And uh, this is a plastic watch with real diamonds on the dial. That's interesting. Yeah. We can't, so, so Swatch, like, they basically had like a case for like a decade. And it was just changes in colors and dials. And so there is absolutely no way we can go through every watch they did. But this I found, I tried to find some of the significant milestones. And, uh, and then we'll play around with the collection that we have too. So, but d diamonds in plastic to me uh, seemed pretty uh, significant, right? Yeah. And then also that same year, 1985, they came out with the Raspberry Ice, Mint, and Banana watches, which were scratch and sniff. <laughs> I, I can't possibly fathom who would want that, but apparently that was a thing. And then same year, 85, Swatch sponsors the first ever snowboarding world championships. Here's the other thing about Swatch that's so interesting. As we're going to go through this, there, there were Red Bull before Red Bull. Like every extreme, before the X Games and before, they're, they're before Red Bull, Swatch pretty much had their own extreme sports series, um, which we're going to get to in a second. But I just found that to be... I didn't. I was too young to know this shit was really... To, to make the connection yeah. when it was going on. But um, So that's, 80, by, that's 1985. They've, they're doing the first or anything. 1986, um, we have the Pop Swatch. Pop Swatch is kind of cool because you can remove the entire uh, case and movement from the strap. And you can then pin it to your clothes 
or otherwise stick it to your clothes, or even like uh, magnetically stick it uh, to your refrigerator or something, which is pretty neat. And look at that. It's a uh, Rico Avalanche Recovery System, which oh. uh, I don't what know is, if they're still that? doing it. What is that about? Uh, it's a, a little Reco, sensor. it says, yeah. So like you were saying with snowboarding? Yeah. So you could wear this when you go snowboarding, and if you got caught in an avalanche or lost on the mountain, oh, it has a they can search for you. It's a... Uh, it's not a beacon that transmits, but it will return a signal. Oh, if they a, turn on their radar and uh-huh. shoot out whatever a radar blast, it'll say yeah. that, oh, there's somebody with Rico who's situated here and they're lost or whatever. So that's pretty interesting that's to, pretty to cool. see that. I feel yeah. like that's what they were using in Cliffhanger to find the cases, <laughs> yeah. right? Because yeah. you needed that big ha- that big thing to look. Yeah. that's Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yep. I did not know about that. That's a good one. Yeah, they uh, Swatch really was, is heavy into the, the skiing and the snowboarding. They like that. Um, and I imagine if you think about skiing and snowboarding outfits from the 80s, it makes a lot yeah. of sense. It fits with Swatch. Yeah, and I mean, you know, plastic, it won't get cold in the snow. Like a metal watch could get cold in the snow. You're not going to smash, you know, if you smash it, like, who cares? It's $50. Yeah. You know, so that's 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 a argument for Swatch. Um also in 1986, I'm sure everyone has heard of the artist Keith Haring, very famous uh, pop art from the 80s, uh, died of AIDS, a lot of famous, uh, really, really iconic style. Um, Swatch, basically, so if you go through, if you go through Swatch's like history, um, and like every year, it shows you like, you know, on the website, like here's highlights of like what's going on and then art. And it shows you all the collabs between the artists every year. If we went through every collab with every artist, even every artist that like you've heard of, it, we would be here for 13 hours. Like there's so many artist collabs. Um, and I'm we got to have a few in here. You got to see any? Um, no artist collabs in oh, here no? that I see. Those ones, I mean... They're pretty rare, super collectible. Obviously, um, there's traveling like uh, displays, museums, and stuff like that. Yeah, they that, call that it the museum. Yeah, the Swatch Museum, which is the traveling sh- show yeah. of artist collab Swatch watches. Yeah, I got to see it in New York when I lived there, and it really? was it was amazing. So a lot of the ones that you you would see like on their website, they're really rare stuff, and uh-huh. in magazines when they're talking about the rare swatches, I got to see a lot of those in person. And man, some of them are. Pretty wacky. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I even wrote. I, I don't. I don't have a number, but I wrote in all caps next to the Keith Haring collabs. Very valuable. Yeah. So I don't. I, ma- I imagine the most. I think as of uh, recently, the most expensive swatch to ever sell at auction was uh, fifty six thousand Swiss francs. Yeah. Which is a lot, but that was a long time ago. That was like yeah. in the nineties. Like I don't know about recently. That was the only one I found. Um, but yeah, it's crazy, right? So, uh, where were we? Keith Haring, yes. Okay, 1988 brings us. All right, where where were we in terms of production? 85 was 10, 10 the 10 millionth swatch. Yeah. 1988, company's fifth anniversary selling watches to the public. Their 50 millionth swatch is sold. Uh, <laughs> more uh, collabs uh, with companies this time instead of just artists, including. La Puff, which I think is a cosmetics company, uh, and they also uh, work with begin to d- uh, develop non watch products such as sunglasses, etc., and other accessories. Uh, 1989 brings us to the cre- the development of the Swatch Creative Lab in Milan. I don't really know what they do there, but I'm guessing they just invite artists to come in and paint on watches until they come up with something. Yeah. That sounds like a fun time. <laughs> I wonder if that's still a thing you could do. That'd be kind of cool. They still have artist collaborations coming out I regularly the, and you can uh, you can join like uh mailing lists and just like uh just like with Rolex, you know, You're trying to get those hard to hard to score watches, you got to have connections. Oh my god. Did I tell you? I don't think I told you about this. Um I was going to text you, but I was in England and I was at <clears throat> sidebar from Swatch real quick, but just because you brought that up. Yeah. I was in England and I, I, I walked into the Rolex store where I was, and I don't want to say exactly where I was because I don't want to blow up this person's spot because he was nice. But I walked in and obviously there's no steel. Obviously. It's, and there's a lot of date just and, you know, the standards, right? But, but no sport watches at all. And I go, you know, I'm wearing my uh, GMT. And so I go, 
you know, I go, I go, do you even have a Jubilee I can just look at? You know, I go, I'm not going to fight you for it or anything like that, but do you have one I can just look at? And he goes, nope. And he goes, I don't even know when I'm going to get one. He said, I have to sell seven regular watches to get allocated one sport watch, and I don't get to choose which one it is. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And I go, yeah, my friend, you know, my friend told me that if I want to get on the list, I pretty much have to find your two ugliest date just and buy them. And he goes, your friend's science is sound, but his scale is off. And I go, how far off? And he goes, two presidents, one with diamonds. So that's like, for those who can't do that math, (laughs) he basically is saying to have the privilege of spending 10 grand on a sport watch, you have to spend 85 grand in watches you may not want at at all. Yeah, <laughs> which is which is why you can get them uh, um, secondhand, brand new, or whatever. Yeah, that's for why twenty five or twenty. Yeah, or I mean that's like why that. that's why paying five over to get a yeah. new in box from a gray market guy may not financially be the dumbest thing if you actually want the watch. Yeah, right? crazy, right? That's that's just crazy. Okay, where were we? I apologize, folks. We're back to Swatch. We were talking, oh, 50 millionth Swatch. Right. The Creative Lab. Ah, 1989. The pro team is established to showcase Swatch on extreme athletes from new emerging sports. So they literally have assembled a multidisciplinary athletic squad a la Red Bull in snowboarding, rollerblading, freestyle skiing, skateboarding, BMX, all these new sports, like pre-X Games, uh, and Swatch uh, comes up with this team. Um, Sean Palmer, the snowboarder, remember the amazing yeah. snowboarder? He was a Swatch pro team member. Um, then, 1989, this might be familiar to some people my age, Swatch comes out with the twin phone. This was a, this is Swatch's foray into non-watch products with the same sort of fun, funky uh Loose, well, lucite's not the word. Sort of transparent, translucent plastic ethos. I had a twin phone. Yeah, I my parents back in the day were I when I was a kid. I was not allowed to have a television or a phone in my room. The theory that was that my that I would be spend all day on the phone right, <laughs> or on TV. And the truth is, I never did either of those things. I don't actually like enjoying talking on the phone, but I really liked disobeying my parents, and so. I drilled a hole in the back of my dresser and ran a cable behind my bed to the outlet and hit a twin phone in my dresser. <laughs> and if I wanted to... Which is so... What a dumb idea this yeah. is because the whole house had one phone line. Yeah. If I was on the phone, someone was going to figure it out. <laughs> but I had a red twin phone hidden in my, in my dresser that I was trying to sneak around having a phone in my bedroom. So thanks, Swatch. <laughs> Stupid. 1990... Uh, Swatch comes out with their chronograph, the first complication. We do have one of those. Yeah, we've got one? chronographs. Yeah, yep. pull up a chronograph. Let's look let's at a watch this, in person. Uh, Through the box? No, let's take it out of the box. Yeah, they sent us all these watches in, in boxes. They're well, all, they're they all have the same box. The good news is they all have the same box. Uh, different oh, paper no, inside, sli- though. Oh, the, the paper. Yeah. Oh, so here's a, here's a Swatch chrono. Ooh. Ooh, we're going to knock that light down a little bit, maybe. Yeah, there she goes. Ah, it's lovely. And what's beautiful about this is not only do you have those those nicely uh, gold plated plastic pushers, yeah, but you've also got this beautiful paisley strap. The, I actually like the paisley right. That's strap. pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's kind of neat. I think what what I what um excuse me what st- is this a quartz chronograph? Yes. Okay. What stands out to me is like how far the sub dials are pushed outside. Yeah. Well, because on on these quartzes, mm-hmm. uh, you've got. Uh, Multiple coils, and the coil, um, you'll, you, they were actually known for also opening the dial and showing the coil, which is like showing the open escapement of a watch and yeah. seeing the, the beat. Uh-huh. But instead, they're showing this electronic coil yeah. just of like copper wire. Um, do you I have, can, do you yeah, have, I have one? one right here? Yeah, I can let's throw let's, that under there. Yeah, let's, throw, let's see what the. Uh, so you oh, see yeah. the, the coil in there? <laughs> Instead of like open heart, it's like yeah. open battery. <laughs> it's right. Like kind of dumb actually. So basically behind each oh, um, behind each register for the counter, there's a coil. So you need all this extra room for oh, these electronic components that yeah. were larger back then because it was new technology. 
So that so this watch won't have. It's not like it has an actual chronograph module on a quartz movement. It has no. Some it's separate, fully integrated. Fully integrated, right? And that has to do with the with the some of the bridges and stuff being in the case that you can use more of the. Yeah, or am I just guessing the, that? And I'm wrong. So the way these were put together were very different than mechanical watches at the time. Mechanical watches were put together by people. Now oh, we're moving right. into we're just, a lot there's of no like, humans anymore. Yeah, I mean there were still humans at this time, but everything was designed to be like electronically welded plastic parts, uh, and so that it doesn't open up, which is why everything loads in through the front, and then you have this little spot right there where you can actually replace the battery on your own. So as the owner, when the battery dies, you can pull the uh, just, pull out a quarter just, and yeah, yeah. or a nickel or whatever, and open it up, put a new battery in there, and if it works, it's good. If it doesn't work, it's garbage. <laughs> and you go back <laughs> to the swatch store and get another one. <laughs> the road, yeah, yeah. They weren't designed to be repaired or anything like that. So a lot of times these movements are actually electronically laser welded together. Oh yeah. So instead of having screws on the bridge, it's, it's just, just clued shut. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Uh, in 1990, 97% of all swatches tested met chronometer certification. And the way that sentence was written in swatches history made it sound like that wasn't in exactly intentional. Like, it kind of just worked out that way. Like, they weren't going for that. That wasn't a, a goal of, like, let make these things be super, super accurate, although I think they did want it to. It made it sound like that surprised them. Yeah. <laughs> like they like they were happy but maybe not prepared. Well, think about the Swiss for for hundreds like for so many years they were working to make these super fine parts, polish them perfectly. Oh, you know who's probably them, going nuts like, the fucking Omega people. Yeah, the Omega the guys. Omega, that the were Omega. like I was the head timer for <laughs> 30 years yeah. in order to get COSC certification. Yeah, I remember we were doing Omega and we're yeah. going through it was like, "Oh, Steve timed this one. Well, yeah. it must be the best." And it's like Yo, I'm gonna stamp the shit out of plastic. Or I'll see you down there. Like, yeah, it's fucking awesome. But that's the power of uh, the quartz oscillator. That's yeah, Just, it's super accurate to begin with, and it takes a lot to mess it up. And uh, and now shit starts getting functional. The Scuba 200 is launched in 1990, which is Swatch's first dive watch, and we have at least one Scuba. Oh, we have a we lot got a of bunch scubas of Scubas. Here. Okay, um, the, and these are fully functioning dive watches. Yeah, like. So this is this, this one is, right here. I, I mean, imagine uh, to me, imagine. I think you got to have a great sense of humor because if you go out on a dive, like a commercial dive boat, and everyone's got their like Oruses and Vostok amphibias and sea dwellers and shit, um, and you roll up with this. <laughs> You can, yeah, right. <laughs> it's like it's got like polka dots in it. It, 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 it resembles a jellyfish, actually. Yeah. Um, what else do you have? Another? Do we have one that looks more normal? Yeah, we have we have definitely a more masculine one over here. This, you've got like the the pina colada kind of yeah, thing going on. Pina colada is appropriate. But color. then you've got a little more like a little muted, utilitarian. Yeah, black all and black yellow. strap. Yeah. Basic, you know, easily, uh, very legible. It's even got the big dots, like my Seiko. Yeah, I like the right? big dots. Yeah, what are these things? These things, they don't weigh anything, right? I mean, and they, they're they're just plastic. They but feel like they meter water resistance. I mean, it feels like it came out of a cereal box. Yeah, and today they're they're building things out of titanium and steel and like. Well, actually, that's you know you the know? problem I have with a lot of the titanium watches is that to me they feel too light. Yeah, a lot of people like the lightness and like great, good for you. Like, but to me, I like to have a little bit of weight. Yeah. Um. And uh. And these being like just so light, I I almost, I was just like, oh man, you can't even feel them there. I, th- I feel like you want them there. Yeah. Maybe you don't. This scuba looks nice. I like the color scheme on that one. Right. Yeah. They. I mean, there's like infinite color schemes with these things. They just keep. They've only made in their entire history like f- seven or eight different models. But they can crank out so many color schemes. This one's my favorite, the sort of translucent blue with yeah, the yellow. Yeah, and even if you look at the band, since it's on a black background, it might not show up that great. The band's kind of translucent, The band is kind of translucent, translucent blackish green color. Or you can put a, the white piece of paper behind it. Yeah. Um, this one is fun. I like... Oh, yeah, it kind of is. It actually right? looks lighter when you put the thing through You see, it. it's kind of translucent there. Yeah, yeah. When you, I, I like the, the combination of fun color but not... 
super hokey on that. Yeah, one. exactly. Yeah, doesn't look like a pair of those uh, <coughs> jelly flip flops. Right. Yeah, you, you want to avoid it looking like the shoes. If yeah. It, like, the, although some people, the, that's what the they phone want. looks like the shoes. Yeah. <laughs> Some people want, yeah, they do. Want yeah, to they're like that's that is Swatch right there, right? Jelly, but I guess I mean I guess do people still dive with these? I guess they probably do, right? Yeah, uh, you know what? For a long time, I was obsessed with the the scuba one. They have a scuba one that actually has a depth gauge in it, I, and I, I wanted to get one. I wanted to find one, and I never pulled the trigger on one. They're a little more expensive. These ones have tags that say fifty bucks. Yeah, so these were again very inexpensive. Right. The one with the depth gauge, I think, was like a hundred or one fifty, so but my, it has a depth gauge. It, yeah, I mean, it's probably two or three hundred now, but if yeah. it's, for a depth gauge watch, like that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, they uh, they also, as I, I think I wrote it down later, they also have an uh, altimeter watch. But it's yeah. uh, it's not altimeter, not for pilots. It's some um, elevation for yeah, back for... backcountry skiing. Yep. Um, where were we? Nineteen ninety, right? They uh, they then launch the Swatch Club, which is the the Swatch Fan Club. Oh, I had a, that's a lovely picture. Here's another. I, I guess we skipped over this picture because we had a chronograph here. But there's another image of a of the chronograph, which I really like the dial layout of. This one has much bigger subdials than the other one. They're still probably just as spread out, but the shape of the dials is different. Um, oh no, have I I've lost have I lost a page? Oh no, where is it? Oh no, I lost it. Yeah. And uh, where's we had another one? Just yeah, I've got a person one. one right here. Yeah, we have a couple chronographs. We have so many swatches, it's actually kind of hard to keep track of all of them right <laughs> yeah. now. Um, this one's pretty cool. Oh, that one's this one has a real pilot's watch vibe to it. Yeah. I like that. And the subdials are even a little reflective, so you have like the black uh, dial. Oh but yeah, you see the well, yeah. When you turn it at reflective. that angle, yeah, black on black. Yeah, yeah. It's a slightly different tint to them. Yeah. How cool! Uh, so I was saying, in 1990, Swatch launched their fan club, which uh, offered access to exclusive fan club watches. The uh, the very I'm not going to give you every year uh, since 1990 of the of them, but the first one was quite iconic, and this is what it's called the Golden Jelly. Actually, a pretty cool looking watch. It looks like it's got uh, some. Uh, it looks like gold in there. It's definitely not, but it's cool. It's you can see right through it, which I really like. It's fully kind of translu- translucent. Actually, I would say a transparent case. Case that looks like like glass. Uh, this golden jelly is highly collectible today. Uh, in 1991, they joined up with Volkswagen to try to develop a, a city car, which we never heard anything about. However, um, Swatch was absolutely instrumental in developing the smart car. Yeah, uh, and uh, that it, was Hayek Engineering uh, influence in that in the smart car. Yeah, in the smart in, car in co- in combination with Mercedes Benz. Yeah, um, and also they are terrible. Um. <laughs> also in 1991, the first uh, Swatch Automatic, first self-winding watch. Do we have any of those? We do. Let's we got an auto? Uh, this is an auto, yeah. So the and quartz, this one looks pretty so, tame, actually. But Swatch, Swatch Cameron never did manual hand-winding, right? It was always either quartz or automatic Ooh, that would that would be a uh, question for an expert. I don't. Um, I, kill, I there couldn't. may be a rare one. I don't know, but I would imagine they'd go straight to automatic. Yeah, I think because all the early stuff was quartz, and then they made a big deal out of the automatic. But I don't think I found any hand wind movements. So Check these out. here's the autos. There we go. These are pretty cool. These look more like quote normal watches, with the exception of the sort of translucent cases. Right. Um, and if you look on the, so they have the translucent case, and they have dates. And oh, so the translucent back. Translucent, because it's, it's a one-piece deal. So where can you see on this, Cameron, can you point out where, like, what would be part of movement that is now just part of case? Is there, uh, is no, there something on, on obvious? No, on these ones, it's different. Okay. On these ones, it's So these are cases different. with movements in These them. are cases where they drop the movement in. Do they still um, drop it in from the front? On these, let me take a quick look. Uh, I would think so, because that was their whole deal. Nope, this one has a snap on back. So you could actually snap this back off and actually go through this automatic if you wanted. But typically this automatic would be replaced yeah. with a new automatic. Uh, and then they'll have an assembly line type service to go through that automatic and refurbish it. This one seems like it's in good working order. Yeah. It's nice, actually. It's got, uh, it's got a pretty, pretty smooth sweep. Let me see if I can zoom in. It's not a it's not a rough sweep. 
Yeah, it's and good. check this one out. It's pretty cool because uh, it's translucent, but also from the front, you've got no dial on it. And it's like blue and pink with oh, the pink that's on the fun. hands. It's pretty red. I like the ha- yeah. It's a fully there's right? just no dial, but really bold colored hands. Yeah, that looks that's a fun one. I and like you got that. The blue strap. These automatics are cool. Yeah. Although without a dial, you can't really tell it's upside down, can you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you do have those little loom plots on there, but other than that, very cool. Uh, also, oh, so 1991 is uh, okay. First self winding, and then we have swatch eyes, the clip on sunglasses. Um, also 91, the uh, the rare art swatch sells for 56,000 francs. And here's one of my here. This one is awesome. Check this out. Swatch the beep, <laughs> which is just like it sounds. This is a swatch with an integrated pager. Fuck yeah. So, DL, if you happen to be slanging on the corner, you don't want to be carrying that pager. It looks real shady. And this has this an LCD screen uh, on the bottom of the uh, bottom third of the of the dial, and that is a straight up beeper. All right, that was the first Apple Watch right there. The <sighs> That's first a smart uh, smart watch. That is the smartest watch out there. Ninety two, the hundred millionth swatch. Jesus. So we went. So let me do that. I'm just going to do that math one more time. Nine, so they started in 83. By 85, they made 10 million. That's two years. By 88, they made 50 million. And three years later, four years later, by 92, they made 100 million. Uh, and launched the stop swatch. Do we have a... We, you said we have one, right? Yeah, we do have a stop swatch. Pull out the stop swatch. What is a stop swatch? Uh, stop swatch, I believe you can start it and stop it. Um, I don't know if these have batteries that are working in them. It doesn't look like it. Stop swatch. But you see how uh, on the dial you've got stop, and then up at the top you've got, uh, I think it says start. Yeah, start. Where um, does it say start? At the top with that little purple uh, oh, it's thing. Hit, is it kind of hard to read because s- it's purple and pink. Um, but and it says start at the top there. So it's like a chronograph? Uh, or, uh, I've never operated one, but I think so. This crown, you push it, uh-huh. and the hands will go from running the time to turning into a stopwatch. It'll it'll go to the center, and then it'll start ticking, uh, and actually measure elapsed time, and then you can reset it. I think. How do here's I, one. Here's the exact watch right well, there. I can't play a video. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I can't play a video to see exactly how it works. Okay, so pretty much it turns itself into a yeah, chronograph. instead of having subdials. Instead of having subdials. Yes. That, that seemed to me like the, what the point was. Yeah. That, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, it's hidden in there, Okay, so cool. you don't see it. Stop Swatch. I like I, I, Swatch is good at naming their stuff. Yeah. I like people who are good at naming things. Um, then 93, the Swatch Musical. And the Musical is the first... Uh, uh, alarm watch uh, with a reminder uh, function, and it played music, and that music uh, was written by different composers. And so they would have famous composers come in and com- compose little digital tunes for the uh, for the musical to play. And they had a lot of different versions of the musical over the years, um, and uh, a lot of different, com- at least seven or eight different composers come in and, uh, and create uh, uh, songs for it. That same year, Nicholas G. Hayek releases the Tresor Magique, which is the first ever precious metal swatch, and it's in platinum with uh, what looks like a blue uh, crocodile or alligator band. And what what clock does this thing look like, Cam? It looks like uh, there's a very famous clock in Prague. Like the Astro clock we talked yes, about, right? Yeah. That's on the side of a building. Uh yeah, and well, a clock tower, a clock tower, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, it's this thing is pretty cool looking, actually. I like it. It's the same yeah. size and shape as a normal swatch. Um, and I don't even know. Does it even have a special? It do- would probably doesn't even have a special movement, right? It probably just has the automatic movement. Yeah, it's just a a unique dial, but I don't think there's any unique function on it. It, just, it appears yeah. to have a second hand, hour hand, minute hand, and then just that fancy looking dial. Just time. And of course a platinum case. <laughs> yeah, right. And then they come out same with the same year with the Aqua Chrono. We've actually got uh, this one's called the CEO. And uh <laughs> What's that one about? It, it looks professional. Really? Uh, yeah. 
It's small. But it's a, it's it has the metal phase. case front as well. I don't believe it's a precious metal. It might be plated, like gold. plated gold or, or something like that. Not solid gold, I don't think. But uh, this is the CEO watch. The CEO. Let's bring that exposure down. Yeah, I'll whack that down a bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's still got the plastic case, but they snapped the uh, metal piece on the front. That's funny. So it looks like something a CEO would wear with a suit. It's very funny. Yeah. It's small, too. It's definitely like a uh, salary man swatch. Yeah. For sure. Um, <laughs> the platinum one is still making right? me laugh. Um, so then the, uh, they come out with the Aqua Chrono, in which they, uh, they combine the stopwatch uh, uh, dial and movement and hands with the dive case. Uh, 94, 1994. They come out. Oh, wait. Oh, oh. Did I miss? Did I miss one? Oh, no. Oh, boy. Well, it's called the Steel Swatch Irony, um, which is made of metal. Uh, and this line uh, continues to today. Uh, they make a huge, a big variety. And here's a, here's a picture of one. Steel swatches. Watches in metal case. And there's, uh, there's also going to be aluminum ones as well. Uh, same year, 94, they, uh, they come out with the Swatch Lumi, which has a button to light up the dial. Although, if I had to, t- if I had to categorize... Oh, what do you got there, Cam? This one's the Irony Chrono. Irony Chrono? Th- throw that right, in Right, it's there. got that- the metal case. Yeah. It's all in the packaging, so I won't take it off this cardboard thing. Oh, that one's cool. I like that. Metal case. Yeah, can you hit the focus button there? I think yeah. we're a little... we a little bit out of focus. Are we too close? Yeah, pull it, zoom it away just a little bit, and then refocus because I can yeah. I can zoom in on the computer better than the camera can sometimes. That's about right. Yeah, that's nice. This is a good looking watch, actually. Yeah. If this thing like, if it if it was made of a little bit different materials and like had a you know a good movement in it, it could easily be confused for something more expensive. Yeah, for sure. I'm a fan of this one. That's right? a fun one. What's that called? The Irony Swatch Chrono. Irony Chrono. And again, like all the other watches, they had like just a million different, you know, dials and, and designs with this. This one's interesting. These. It comes in this case that's like a cigar case almost. Wow. Yeah. I like that package. Instead of the, the plastic case. Yeah. Interesting. Um, where am I? Ugh. 1995, the Swatch Access. This is a really neat piece um, because it has, I don't know if it has RFID programming or if it can be reprogrammed. They weren't specific if it it could only be programmed once or could be reprogrammed. But it basically was a watch that could double as an electronic wallet or an electronic ticket. So they would give them out for like VIP events. Like there was like something at uh, like a Basel World, and they'd give out these watches, and the watch was your ticket. You'd hold it up next to like a, what was presumably some type of RFID reader, and it would allow it would let you in. Yeah, and they so, were uh, they were still doing these watches. Um, I don't know if they still have them at the factory, but at the uh, the Swatch factory, the employees would wear them. And yeah. it was like their time oh, card that's and, your key. and access key card. Oh, that makes so much yeah. sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. They would also um, they use them at uh, a couple different mountains in Switzerland ah, as yeah. tickets, uh, lift, lift tickets. tickets. That's yeah. cool. Um, very uh, very cool watch. And I think they, I do think, I have a note here that indicates they they might still be doing something like this. 1996, because it wouldn't be a watch show if we didn't talk about fucking space travel. The <laughs> first swatch in space. Above the space shuttle Columbia, uh, they're also the timekeeper for the Atlanta Olympics that year, and have actually been official timekeepers I think ever since. They produced their two hundred millionth watch, so they made a hundred million watches between nineteen ninety two and here we go. We have an Atlanta Olympics. Swatch no shit, right yeah, here. Throw that bitch down there. There we go. My, you know what I have from the Atlanta Olympics? Oh, and this is this is a music hall. Oh, it How is. How did I not catch that? Oh, cool. I wonder what it plays. Uh, we were living in Atlanta uh, just before the Olympics and went down there for the for the Olympics. And my mother, I shit you not, still has a six pack of bottled Coca Cola, special '96 Olympics bottled Coca Cola that we could there never drink. There it is, a music yeah. hall with a transparent dial, Centennial Olympic Games. Yeah, 
Very cool. So I guess over on the left hand side at uh, let's see six seven. so eight and ten o'clock is your on off. See the it's kind of tough to see, but it's basically a kind of like black dots over there um, to have the music or not. I guess. Oh here yeah look here look at the other look at the top of the box here, and you can see melody ah, by Philip Phil Glass. Glass. There you go. So it shows you who the composer is of the melodies. Yeah. Very very cool. So that's your ninety six. We are getting we're getting to the end. Um, now uh, the uh, they 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 make their telephone cordless in '96. Yes, I don't have a picture of it, but they have a Swatch cordless phone. Uh, and then uh, they come out with a watch called the Time Cut, and the Time Cut gets wait okay. When we talked about uh, you got to clear this one up for me because I don't quite have the terminology. When we talked about 97 percent of those watches getting chronometer certified. Right. Yes. They then made a big deal in the history about this time cut watch getting COSC chronometer status. Is that that's better or that's the same as before? So they might have been internally testing them as chronometers uh-huh. uh, rather than an external organization because oh, okay. COSC is external. Oh, that may um, be. so they you may send have, them out. Okay, so that may they originally they may have you know companies do this when they write their own histories. They may have worded it. Yeah, in such a way that they weren't lying, but they were just testing them internally. Yeah, and okay. knowing that they would pass, but these ones they actually okay. sent them out and got the certificates from yes. the outside agency. They, that that's what they did yeah. in '96. The time cut. This watch here gets COSC certification, uh, and they sponsor in '96 also the first ever uh, border cross competition, mm-hmm. snowboarder cross. Which combine if if you've never watched border cross, it's badass. It's where they race down. Uh, what essentially is like a motocross track on snow, on snowboards. And that was significant because it combined alpine borders and freestyle borders into one event, which before ha- w- was never a thing. Back in the day, like, they've mo- they're combined much more now than they were. Like, there's really only kind of like one type of snowboarding now. Back then, it was like super distinct. Yeah. No, I'm on. The alpine boards look like almost like missiles and rockets, and, yeah. the, and the other ones look like uh, skateboards. Um, 96, they also come out with an irony chronograph split seconds uh, in a steel case. 97, they come up with something called the Swatch Skin, which is their ec- an exercise in very thin uh, watchmaking and a huge ad campaign uh, implying that, sh- that people are naked except for their Swatch Skin <laughs> <laughs> watches. All right, Cameron, are you ready for one? Here's where shit gets weird. 1998, the Swatch Beat. So I don't know if Swatch came up with the concept of internet time. I don't think they did. But the Swatch Beat is a watch that keeps internet time. Not, okay, instead of being on a 24-hour day, this watch says that there are 1,000 beats in a day. Now, the good news is, it also, as you can see, this the watch we're looking at is an LCD screen, and it shows 2038, which is the the time, right? 8.38 p.m., uh, military time, but also shows 8.59. So they hypothesize that in internet time, there are 1,000 beats in a day, and so this watch counts internet time. Interesting. Now... That sounds like the kind of thing that you'd be like, all right, that's that's dumb. Good thing that hasn't worked out. Well, if you go to Swatch's um, website and you go to Explore, right now you can click on Internet Time, and it's still here. <laughs> and uh, so it, here's their here's their thing for why to do it. Uh, because if an, it's basically a, a, in a global world, it's designed to eliminate time zones because internet time is the same throughout the world. It's uh, it reminds me of GPS time, right? How all the satellites are are configured and and they're basically determining location by one set time as opposed to um, having a whole bunch of time zones and different things and right. Except guess what. Humans don't really have a problem with time zones. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, we 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 have a it, instead of redefining what time is, let's just have a smoother 
t- like we ended up with Google Calendar, you yeah. know, <laughs> that, which, I, which is obviously a much better solution. But uh, they made, dude, they made these Beats watches for like a while. Like this was not a one and done. There's, yeah, I didn't, I didn't dwell on it in the history because I just thought that it was silly. But there's like a, there's two, three, four, five variations of the Beats watch. They really tried to make this thing happen for yeah. a while. Seems like a like a spy watch or something. I'll call you at eight hundred fifty nine. Like a fucking military <laughs> time. If that's you yeah. know what I mean. If you want, if what's wrong with military time? If that's really, <laughs> if the point is to not be confused about time zone. Anyway, Jesus. Um, or just use GMT or whatever. Um, <laughs> okay, 1999. Swatch develops a, uh, a geo-positioning-based sports timing system for use with yacht racing. That was the first time that had ever actually been done, where the uh, where yeah. the start-finish line and all this was done via GPS timer and not, with via, a signal. And not huh. actually visually. Um, 2000, they come out with the Swatch Square, which is literally just... A square. It's their first square case. Uh, and then 2001, they begin uh, coming out with the oversized cases. The, uh, the, the, they make, they're basically the same, same case, but in a 40 millimeter and 41 millimeter. Do you have any of those? Um, I don't believe we do. These are all older ones, yeah. We don't have one. Okay. Um, then, then there are some watches that are kind of silly, don't really matter, frankly. Uh, and then the fun as uh, uh, a new oh, Jesus I've, I have been lost here. Uh, then 2004 they come out with the fun scuba, which I did not pull up a picture of, and I feel derelict to my duty. Uh, and it is a dive watch that actually uh, records uh, your dives. Uh, here That's it, the depth one, yeah. The, the fun scuba. The I fun knew it was scuba. Something. Here, here it is. Yep. 71 bucks used, there Cameron. You there you go. It has the depth gauge and it it remembers uh, your max depth. Your right? max depth. Yeah. And uh, so there you go. Same year, they come out with a watch called the Paparazzi that I shit you not, and one of those ones I bet they wish they could forgot about. And this is 2004, is integrated with MSN's news service. Awesome. That one is really. <laughs> That one has really, uh, has really aged well. And then um, one year later, uh, to complement the fun scuba, they come out with the fun border. And oh, I mean, my picture is not sufficiently zoomed in, and I apologize for that. Here is the fun border, and this one has the uh, altimeter, but it's just really more like an elevation uh, thing because you're not flying. You're, it's for the mountains. Uh and that's it, except for, where are we here? The, that's, is that it? Yeah, that's it. The System 51, which is where we are today. The end or the current state of Swatch. Cameron, what's the System 51? It's an automatic watch, which is kind of interesting because they were all about the quartz watches. Um, but the idea behind it is System 51 is 51 pieces, to make an automatic watch, which is an extraordinarily low number of pieces. Yeah, like what's the next simplest one? Um, a like simple automatic will be like 150 parts. Okay, so how do you eliminate two-thirds of the parts? Just crazy amounts of engineering R&D and also having machines put it together. So the in the factory, it's, it's without people. So it's put because things are tack welded, you eliminate yeah. screws. Is that is that the yeah? Idea? You eliminate screws. You eliminate having uh, like jewels. No oh, jewels. No jewels. Um, or very few jewels. Actually, I take that back. But so here's an image for those wondering of what a System Fifty One movement looks like. So yeah. what are we looking at here, Cam? So you're looking at you here. You can use the mouse if you like. Uh, yeah. You so want. like around the uh, the edge. Sorry, that's where did that go? <laughs> so, okay, sorry. yeah. I've yeah. never given. I just put Cameron on the spot. I've never given him the mouse. Before. So, like <laughs> around the edge, you've got uh, the oscillating weight, and it's on like a plastic or a sapphire disc here, and attached to the center, so you can see through to the movement. Mm-hmm. Um, but you see there is a screw, but all of these things, these other screws and and points, they're all like press fit together. Yeah, uh, all on an assembly line without humans. So these parts are actually processing through manufacturing, being moved around by robots, finished by robots, um, all the different like plating and, and applied graphics and 
uh, everything done by robots, all without humans. In and a every sealed... time you eliminate a human, you're eliminating parts. Yeah, pretty you're, much. Pretty much, because there's certain parts that it's just it's tough for robots to do. You could not have a human put this watch together, but it's been designed for robots. So for the larger companies like Rolex, what they did is they took regular watches and they didn't change the design. They just created robotic ways of assembling certain parts of them Mm -hmm. and adapted the robots to the watch. Interesting. With the System 51, they adapted the watch to the The robots. robots. So it's extremely... um, So it's a good movement? Yeah, it, it's a it's a great movement. It's a solid movement. I mean, it's not like high dec- decoration or anything. No, right. Fancy, but just but in terms of like a functional, good quality, yeah, functional quality movement. Yeah, and because there's, uh, because they're assembled by robots, the tolerances have to be much tighter because right. there's no robot that can think, oh, that's a little tight here. Uh-huh. We need to change this and fix that. No, it's like if it's too tight, then it's garbage. So, um, so also the tolerances are not serviceable. Tight. Yeah, uh, not that I'm aware of. So you, does it have a service life and then it just gets thrown out and replaced? Uh, I don't know too much about the service, but I would imagine Who the you fuck send it. A hundred dollar watch. Yeah, it's I mean, so inexpensive. Yeah, there might be a way to send it to Swatch, and what mm-hmm. they'll do is they'll pop the movement out, mm-hmm. replace the movement with a new one. That makes sense. Uh, like just snapping it in there, yeah. and then you have fresh oils in there, and it's it's good to go. Cool. Yeah. So there's your history, um, and that's where we're at today with Swatch. Anything from this collection really jump out at you? I mean, we've shown a few, but are we, have we, do we have other examples that we may have overlooked that are extremely cool? Um, I mean, Just most of this is kind of the tame stuff. There's, there's much wackier stuff out there. I mean, check this that's out. That's a this pretty is fun, some interesting color. That's a fun right chrono, here. yeah. Right? I mean, yes. Oops, sorry. My, wrong one. <laughs> Oof. Right? Yeah. All the color blocking and... Just wild. That is saved by the bell status right yeah. there. That's I mean, yeah, Swatch hasn't had a lot of different models. I mean, they've only been around for 40 years. So, yeah. um, you know, th- it's really seven or eight different models in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of color combinations. And there's some, there are some really cool, like, interesting ones where they're different. Mm. Um, kind of like the Fun Scuba and the Altimeter Watch. And the squ- there's um, a square. I didn't have a picture yeah, of the Yeah, there's but... some that look like chili peppers, like the case. <laughs> yeah. There's there's some that have, like, hair off of them that they glued oh, yeah, on, like, someone, felt like hair. Someone had a... Fu- yeah, where, where did I find that? Maybe, like, in uh, in their history, I think that one of the images had... Yeah, yeah here, look at this. Exactly. Here's it looks the, like a, a huge like, eyelash like, thing like going around. It looks like a Gucci slipper. <laughs> yeah. But then uh, you've also got some some interesting ones, which I would consider a complication. There was one that I saw that had Nicholas G. Hayek, the the um, the person, the person. Yeah. So the the owner of Swatch Group at at one point, um, where his face was actually on the dial. Yeah. And the dial, as time advanced, the there were areas where the hours were that would flip upside down. So what would happen is at one point, his face would come into focus because it was an image yeah, of yeah. his face and on the it, dial of this watch. And, and then they would flip upside down. Well, so there was one a watch a called day, a, it would become in a, focus. There was a watch called a puzzle motion watch. Yeah, where the, that's exactly it. Is that what it was? Yeah. yeah. They, I, I, it, was, it disappeared into my notes, and I apologize in my derelictness of duty and not mentioning it. But they had a watch where... I, the, a puzzle would undo itself and redo itself on the dial of the watch. Yeah, so there's one that's his face, which is pretty Sorry. funny, um, but there's other ones that have other images, uh, and they Let's come into focus. How, can you search for GIFs on on Google Search? How do where where where's a good where's a good example showing the differences of what it looks like? Uh, the, uh, I mean, they all right. Well, hang on. Here's here's uh yeah so see the circles flip. Where are we at here? So if we're looking at here's one. So this is a puzzle motion watch. Oh yeah, it's like a kaleidoscope. It's yeah, it's a bunch of discs. It's a bunch of discs that spin. Around. So you can see one, two. Where are the discs? Wait. The discs are right one, here. But they're but oh they're laying on top of each other. Yeah. Yeah. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight discs, yeah, that spin, and it looks like a jumble of nothing until 
one certain hour <laughs> and minute in the day, yeah. everything comes together and you're like, whoa, that's a picture of Nicholas G. Hayek's face or <laughs> that's a, you know, whatever, an artistic pattern this or whatever so it crazy. might be. Yeah. yeah. Nuts, right? Yeah. Those ones I like a lot. They're pretty yeah. cool. That's real cool. I don't, I don't, I'm not inspired to go on a swatch buying spree, but if you wanted to have 300 watches, you know, one for every day of the year, yeah. this is where you're going to be. And they're relatively inexpensive. Yeah. A cool, like, easy to collect kind of thing. and Especially in, like, our Radwood culture. Yeah. You know, people buying shit to wear to Radwood, but yeah. a swatch will get you right in the door. Yeah. yeah and, and, and I mean, honestly, I think if you were wearing some of this stuff, m- me, watch guy, would go, oh, that's a cool swatch. Like, I, I definitely would. Like, I'm not, I, I don't think watch people are too snobby to, to appreciate a cool swatch. Yeah. For sure. And, and swatch is the reason that the a lot of the current watch companies still exist today yeah so they well they renamed the important. big group swatch group yeah you know what i mean it's not it's not like it's the ashwag still and swatch is one of the things they make they, yeah. they swatch got the the name on the building yeah <laughs> that is awesome and you know what i think um it when you appreciate the the success story of the business as well you know it's a big, uh, it's a big thing. So that's Swatch, folks. Good show, Cam. Follow Cameron on Instagram, Weiss Watch Company. Buy a watch from him. If you do, his lovely wife Whitney will include a uh, a, a strap change tool and an extra strap for your watch. Uh, if you put uh, watch and listen into the comments box in the order, Cameron is polishing cases on Sunday, so obviously he's making a lot of watches. Yeah, I've not? been working hard. Pretty soon, Cameron's not going to be able to make these fucking things himself, folks. You're going to want to yeah. buy one while... I, I'm glad I have one that Cameron made. Not yeah. that, like, whoever you hire, I'm sure, will do a good job. But in the long game, I want, like, before you reti- before your hands retire, like, I'm going to need, like, three more. Yeah. It is flattering. Sometimes we get uh, emails and people ask specifically, like, will Cameron be putting my watch together? Yeah. When you get to That's, send him a picture, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sometimes we can. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Just do that. You can come sit on this stool and watch me make your watch. Right, that'd be the worst. <laughs> You'd have to make them sit on another side of a piece of glass so they can't yeah. talk to you. That's yeah. how they do it. All right, folks, follow me on Instagram, the Smoking Tire, and you know the rest. All the other things. It's the Watch and Listen podcast. Next week we're doing Independence. No, we're not. I'm an idiot. We're not doing Independence. We're doing watches from places that aren't Switzerland. Yes. Which does not necessarily mean independence by any means. Just yeah. means watches from places not Switzerland. Thanks, folks. We'll see you later. Bye.